Here's Johnny. Mixed martial arts is in a constant state of evolution. From the style versus style days of sumo wrestlers getting their teeth kicked out by savat fighters, to the days when jiu-jitsu was the Konami code of MMA, to the modern day invasion and domination of the Habib clones. By 2001, Sakuraba had proven that catch wrestling was like kryptonite to the Gracie's jiu-jitsu, but the Pride debut of Vanderlei Silva was a reminder that consummate violence would always be an integral part of the MMA metagame. Silva had been training Muay Thai since the age of 15, initially out of a desire to attract women. In his own words, he was chubby, ugly, and poor, so his only hope of finding a girlfriend was by working on his body and becoming a fighter. He trained at Shootabox Gym in Curitiba, Brazil. Shootabox is a gym infamous for sparring sessions that had all the tenderness of a gang initiation and that was home to more hardcore killers than a Siberian gulag with fighters like Vanderlei, Shogun Hua, Anderson Silva, and in the modern day era, Charles Oliveira, to name but four. Silva made his first appearance at Pride 7 in 1999, but between 99 and 2000, he bounced between Pride and the UFC. Silva fought twice in the UFC, his first fight being a 44 second KO loss to no known weaknesses Vitor, and his second fight, a shot at the vacant light heavyweight title against Tito Ortiz. And believe it or not, but we live in a timeline where Tito Ortiz, master of the English language and teller of jackal stories, actually holds a unanimous decision win over Vanderlei Silva. After the losses in the UFC, Vanderlei assumed his stock was so low that his chances of getting back into pride were about as good as Tito's chances of becoming a full-time ring announcer. Babalu, you did an awesome job, so why you're a black belt in jiu-jitsu, getting an awesome submission there. I want to tell me what you see, let's go ahead and see by the fight what you saw in the ring. And Silva genuinely thought his career was over and went back to working in his father's bar in Curitiba. But four months after his loss to Ortiz, Vanderlei got the call, and he was back in pride. He racked up four wins over some good and some not so good competition. He beat Guy Mesger. I'm Guy Mesger. I'm here at the Pride. It's real, exciting. And Dan Henderson, who were big names. But fights against guys like Daijiro Matsui and Karl Malenko meant that Silva's popularity was around the same as a spoken word album by Tito Ortiz. He's, he's, reaching for, he's reaching for those grapes. He's trying to make his wine, and the wine's already sounding like a violin with that cheese and wine. Um, then you got the jackals and the rest of the wilderness looking and seeing these lions on that mountaintop. They come over and bother him, the jackals laugh at him, the hyenas laugh at him. Pride's rule set was practically tailor-made for Vanderlei. While the UFC had to strip away most of the moves that once made no-holds-barred fighting the number one sport for adult males with just bleed body paint, the Japanese embraced the spirit of barroom brawlers like Tank Abbott as if it were a long-lost son. Soccer kicks, stomps to the face, and knees to the head of a downed opponent were all perfectly legal in Pride. Every time a fighter did a live-action recreation of the Billy Bats scene in Goodfellas, it was greeted with polite and restrained applause by the Japanese audience. Vanderlei's Muay Thai background meant that his knees and elbows were meat-seeking missiles that could find their target from halfway across the ring, and his valet Tudo background meant that even Pride's love of sheer brutality was probably a little bit restrained compared to what the man known as the Axe Murderer was used to. Silva was a benevolently terrifying spectre in the ring. His baleful stare, trademark wrist roll, and penchant for extreme violence 
made him seem like MMA is Michael Myers. Oh, behave. No, 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 not that Mike Myers, the other one. While other fighters tried to intimidate their opponents with steroid muscles or sweet 2000s era tribal tattoos, Jeff Munson here. a stare down from Prime Vanderlei could melt polar ice caps. Vanderlei didn't make an impact in Japan until Pride, in their effort to have Sakuraba beat the entire population of Brazil one by one, match the two fighters against each other at Pride 30. Vanderlei was a nightmare matchup for Sakuraba. He was easily the best and most ferocious striker Sakuraba had ever faced. Silva's fighting style was unfiltered violence. Silva was the Picasso of knees to the face and Sakuraba's style of eating shots in order to secure a takedown was ill-advised against a totem of violence such as Vanderlei. The match took place at Pride 13 in 2001. In a move more bizarre than having Eric Clapton as the opening act for Sakuraba vs Hoist Gracie, Tito Ortiz presented fighters with bouquets of flowers before the opening bell. Once Tito's head had been airlifted out of the ring, the fight was on. Vanderlei utilized his trademark knees to the head and soccer kicks to claim revenge for Brazil. Sakuraba employed the highly questionable game plan of crawling on all fours trying to grab Vanderlei's ankle. This put him in prime Billy Bats range, and Vanderlei dutifully kicked his face in. One minute and 38 seconds into the first round, Sakuraba suffered his first loss since before his series of Gracie fights. Silva was turned into a star in Japan overnight, and anticipation for a rematch was at fever pitch. Pride was the opposite of the UFC in more ways than just rule sets and spectacle. Whereas the UFC will willingly protect talent like Conor McGregor or Takashi 00 by giving them favorable matchups to build up win streaks, Pride followed a much more brutal philosophy. Rather than give Sakuraba a gimme fight to bounce back after his loss to Vanderlei, they matched him up with a fighter who outweighed him by 50 pounds, fought at light heavyweight compared to Sakuraba's middleweight, and was 10 and 1 when he debuted in Pride. The fighter's name was Quentin Rampage Jackson. Luckily for Sakuraba, Jackson hadn't yet evolved into his final form. No, no, not that final form, but that of an explosive fighter that was famous for brutal slam KOs. Rampage's conditioning was always his biggest weakness, and after an early onslaught, Rampage gassed hard, and Sakuraba won via rear naked choke. As the year 2001 drew to a close, the stage was set for the rematch with Vanderlei. November 3rd, 2001, at Pride 17, Silva would face Sakuraba for the Pride middleweight title. The fight was a much closer affair than their first match, thanks to Sakuraba diving on the first low kick that Silva threw and taking him down. After almost 10 minutes of round one, with the majority spent on the ground, Sakuraba survived until the bell but his shoulder looked like it was trying to escape from his own body, and upon further inspection, the fight was stopped after it was revealed to be a broken clavicle. In what appeared to be an effort to actually kill Sakuraba in the ring, Pride created yet another matchup more ill-conceived than that time Metallica recorded an album with Lou Reed. Oh, 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 
For his next fight, Sakuraba faced Mirko Krokop Filipovic. Krokop was a man with a left high kick more devastating than the user scores for Cyberpunk 2077. And fighting Krokop after you just fought Vanderlei is the MMA equivalent of the Ornstein and Smau fight from Dark Souls. While serving in the Croatian army, Mirko's commanding officer noticed his talent for violence and told him he was wasting his time in the army and should consider professional fighting. Mirko was essentially told by an organization founded on violence that he may be a bit too violent for them. Mirko's nickname, Krokop, came about as on top of his military service, he was also a member of the Croatian police in their armed response unit. The fight sold out a 90,000 seat arena. And really think about that for a second, 90,000 people watched this fight live. That's almost double the attendance of the largest ever UFC gate, Adesanya vs Whitaker, which had 57,000 attendees, and three times the size of Connor's biggest event, the Habib fight, which had 20,000 attendees. All of this at a time when 90% of people in the world thought a rear naked choke was what killed David Carradine. In round one, the power imbalance was on display from the opening bell, with almost every kick or punch from Krokop forcing Sakuraba to stagger backwards. Sakuraba spent the whole round shooting for low single legs, but they were almost completely nullified by Krokop's sprawl. Round 2 was more of the same, but Sakuraba eventually secured a takedown that landed inside Krokop's guard. Krokop landed shots that damaged Sakuraba's eye badly, and the fight was waved off as a Dr. Still not satisfied with their efforts to offer Sakuraba as a skull for the skull throne, Pride rematched Sakuraba with Vanderlei. Their next fight would be in August 2003, and by then Vanderlei had won 9 straight fights, while Sakuraba had lost 3 of his last 4. Vanderlei's shoot a box style proved to be just too much for Sakuraba to overcome, and the years of fighting had well and truly taken its toll on him. He lost all three matchups against Silva. Sakuraba's career in Pride stretched for seven more fights, and while he had some good wins over Ken Shamrock and Kevin Randleman, it was clear his prime years had been the Gracie fight era. The only thing permanent in this world is impermanence, and for Kazushi Sakuraba, the hero of Japan, the real life tiger mask, the Gracie hunter, the man who battled Hoist for 90 minutes, the game had evolved yet again, only this time he was the one being left behind. Pride was a veritable carousel of horsemeat fueled American wrestlers, from Dan Severn to Mark Kerr, Mark Coleman to Kevin Randleman, and the earthquake with legs Bob Sapp. All you motherfuckers are on steroids. All you motherfuckers, all you are on steroids. Bipedal steroid factories were the number one attraction in Japan, but one man stood head and shoulders above the rest the predator, Don Fry. And on June 23rd, 2002, Fry was involved in the most unforgettable MMA fight of all time. Fry had fought in the UFC in the mid 90s, winning the reductively titled Ultimate Ultimate Tournament in 1996, but retired from MMA in 1997 to focus on his career in pro wrestling. Fry joined New Japan Pro Wrestling and proved to be insanely popular with fans. He made good money playing a heel character, which probably explains why it took him till 2001 to make the move to Pride. Fry had a bitter rivalry with Ken Shamrock, solely based on the fact that Shamrock had beaten Fry's mentor and mustache coach Dan Severn at UFC 6. 
Fry discussed the rivalry with the kind of machismo that could make a brick wall grow chest hair. Fry said, I was in the UFC and Dan Severn was a great friend of mine. I saw Ken Shamrock whoop him at UFC 6 and I thought, that's a guy I gotta fight. Anybody who can whoop Dan Severn like that has gotta be a man. And I want to test my size against his, stand next to him at the urinal. Fry and Shamrock would finally meet at Pride 19. After three rounds of checking out each other's meat at the urinal in a totally manly way, Fry won a split decision and considered their rivalry put to bed. Like a Chernobyl meltdown with a moustache, Don Fry emanates potentially lethal levels of testosterone. At Pride 21, Demolition, Fry was initially set to face Mark Coleman. Feels like I'm wearing nothing at all. Nothing at all. Nothing at all. <laughs> Stupid sexy Fry. Coleman was the one remaining guy Fry wanted to measure mustaches with above all others. But Coleman was pulled from the fight due to his lack of a mustache. And true to their spectacle loving circus ass roots, Pride replaced Coleman with six foot five giant Yoshihiro Takayama. Takayama was a pro wrestler on a two fight losing skid in MMA going into the fight. And to be charitable to Takayama, his MMA record would remain not good for his entire career. He was mostly booked by Pride for freak show fights due to his size. Pride's reasoning behind booking Takayama was that he would either win spectacularly via giant smash or lose spectacularly. Nobody expected Takayama to win, and he didn't. But the Great Mustache War of 2002 could not have taken place without Takayama's grit and fighting spirit. Pride 21 was a genuinely awful fight card. Almost every fight went to a judge's decision, and not the good kind of decision like Zhang vs. Young Jacek. The shit kind, like Adesanya vs Romero. Oh no! Even mighty Russian heavyweight Fedor Emelianenko fought to a unanimous decision in the co-main event. Backstage before their fight, Fry and Takayama made the kind of gentleman's agreement World War I generals would have brokered before sending millions of boys to be ripped apart by shellfire. In order to wake the fans up after four excruciating decisions in a row, both men agreed, fight like hell. I was lucky enough to be involved in a fight against them big old boy named Takayama. We walked out there and looked up at that big old Japanese boy. <laughs> Said, Fry, what the hell did you sign your name out to now? Fry versus Takayama is the kind of fight that happens only in movies, yet somehow spilled over into real life. From the opening bell, both men locked up a collar tie and proceeded to do nothing but punch each other in the face. It wasn't, wasn't any better technique or talent involved. We just grabbed each other by the scruff of the neck and just went to, went to town on each other. You know, it made for an exciting eight and a half minutes. This was the only fight in history where the audience was in danger of getting secondhand CTE. For the first time that night, the crowd erupted and commentary duo Bass Rutten and Steven Quadros knew they were witnessing the kind of fight that goes into history books and memes. It was a war of attrition, with both men desperate to see who could deliver maximum punishment while only using their faces to block punches. Ultimately, it would be Don Fry who was declared the winner, 
as both men could only keep this kind of pace up for so long, and after an exhausted and battered Takayama attempted a takedown, Fry landed on top of him, and after some ground and pound that seemed almost tender compared to what had been thrown on the feet, the fight was called off. Fry was declared the winner, and Takayama was awarded an honorary mustache. That was one of the most uh, spectacular things I've been involved in, you know, I guess. A few days later, somebody told me that, you know, we, our, t our time slot had beaten the World Cup soccer time slot of Japan versus Korea. You know, that's pretty damn amazing, you know. Pride's love of spectacle was not reserved solely for the over-the-top opening ceremonies and fully extended to the fights themselves. Fry vs. Takayama was a prime example. Fighter Frank Trigg confirmed that Pride honestly didn't really care who won or lost, and that he was told by Pride's management that as long as you put on an exciting fight, you'd keep getting matches. Don Fry retired in-ring after the fight. But thanks to his performance that night and those Yakuza paychecks, Pride tempted him back for multiple fights after the fight dubbed the manliest of all time. But neither man was ever the same. The damage done to both was evident. Fry had multiple ongoing injuries in his back and shoulder even before the fight and claimed to have been high on Vicodin for the duration of the fight. He would only win five of his next 15 fights before retiring in 2011. Takayama fared even worse. He suffered a brain hemorrhage in 2004, but thankfully survived and even returned to the ring two years later. But tragically, in 2017, Takayama suffered a catastrophic in-ring injury. In a Japanese pro wrestling match, while performing a sunset flip, he landed on his head, suffering a spinal cord injury. He was left paralyzed from the neck down. Don Fry visited Takayama in hospital and delivered this message. Takayama-san, God gave me the greatest opponent anybody could ever ask for. You. You made the greatest fight the world has ever seen. You were the reason that our fight beat the World Cup of Soccer head-to-head -head on TV. You are the image of Bushido and strength and triumph. You are the first person everyone asks about when they meet me. You are the warrior we all look to be. For generations, philosophers have asked, what happens when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? That question was definitively answered, and the answer was Fry versus Takayama. In early 2003, the first cracks in the Pride Empire began to appear. The first four Pride cards were promoted by a company called KRS. KRS was run by a man we met earlier on in part one, Hiromichi Mimose. Mimose was a former Yakuza determined to convince Japan he was a legitimate businessman an act that was about as convincing as this 10 out of 10 review for Brendan Schaub's You'd Be Surprised from IMDB reviewer Brandon Snrub. I like the way Snrub thinks. Mimose received most of his funding for the first four events from the Yakuza, but Pride was giving away money like Krokop gave away head kicks. KRS and Mimose were booted out as promoters of Pride, and while Mimose still maintained a behind-the-scenes presence, a new company, Dreamstage Entertainment, took over promotion of Pride's events. Its president was a man who became synonymous with JMMA, Nobuyuki Sakakibara, and his executive, Naoto Morishita. 
Morishita was the man credited with saving Pride. After the reckless spending of KRS, he completely restructured the promotion, and without his involvement, Pride likely wouldn't have survived past 1998. On January 13th, 2003, Morishita was found dead in a Tokyo hotel. The cause of death was an apparent suicide by hanging, but a cloud of suspicion hung over his death till this day. It was alleged that Morishita was having an affair and hung himself out of guilt over his infidelity. However, his mistress was never found, and any deaths in Japan that have even a hint of Yakuza-related scandal around them tended to be low priority for the Japanese police in those days. With Morishita dead, his shares in Dreamstage Entertainment went to Sakakibara, and another Yakuza we met in part one, Ishizaka. After Morishita's death, a behind-the-scenes war for control of pride broke out between Ishizaka and Mamose. The war had been building up all year, and finally came to a head at Pride Final Conflict 2003. With 80,000 spectators in the Tokyo Dome to watch Vanderlei Silva vs Rampage Jackson, the most important action of that night took place out of sight. According to Fedor and Crow Cop's manager, Miro Miatovich, there were about 100 armed gangsters in attendance that night, representing both Ishizaka and Mimose's crews with shots ready to pop off at any second. In the end, Mimose was removed from Pride without shots being fired at the Tokyo Dome. No longer could he be seen sitting ringside in his trademark baseball cap. Sakakibara and Ishizaka were in charge now. But as the respectable, legitimate frontman of Pride, Sakakibara was probably a little too comfortable hanging out with gangsters like Ishizaka for his own good. The death blow for Pride would be delivered by Sakakibara when he went to war with Antonio Inoki, the wrestler who had wrestle kick boxed Muhammad Ali in the 1970s. The conflict began when Inoki attempted to stage his own MMA event to rival Pride, called Inoki Bombaye. Inoki wanted to put on a big New Year's Eve card, and when Pride got wind of this, they rushed to put together a card of their own to kill off this fledgling competition. But like Brendan Schaub desperately rummaging for a punchline in his stand-up, when Pride went to put on a show with their biggest heavyweight star, Fedor Emelianenko, he was nowhere to be found. Inoki wasn't fucking around. And in order to show just how little a capacity for fucking around he possessed, he poached Fedor right from under Pride's nose. Fedor's contract with Pride was on a fight-by-fight -fight basis, meaning Inoki just had to offer him a few extra dollars and a nice sweater, and Fedor was now the headline attraction for Inoki Bombayé's New Year's Eve card. Gangsters are not generally renowned for their tolerance of being stolen from, so this didn't sit well with Ishizaka, and according to Fedor's manager, after receiving multiple threats and late night visits from Yakuza members, Ishizaka, Sakakibara, and Miatovich had a sit down meeting. With the totally legit public face of pride in attendance, this was set to be a rational discussion, a mutual airing of grievances if you will, with no guns involved. Guns were immediately involved, and Miatovich was told in no uncertain terms that unless he signed Fedor's rights exclusively to Pride, he wouldn't be leaving Japan alive. To the surprise of literally no one, Fedor was immediately signed exclusively to Pride for the low, low price of free. Pride didn't stop at threatening Miatovich, and one of the organizers for Enoki Bombaye, Seiya Kawamata, a small time Yakuza himself, also began receiving threats, and ultimately wound up fleeing Japan altogether in fear for his life. These threats and intimidations would prove to be the final nail in the steroid fueled coffin of Pride. But for now, it's still 2003, and these revelations will remain buried until 2006. Pride crushed Inoki Bombaye in the ratings war, remained the biggest MMA promotion in the world, and was about to go head to head with their biggest competition.
2003 was a lifetime ago. The days of dial-up internet and chat rooms. Chat rooms throughout cyberspace, it's cozy and very safe. Before Mark Zuckerberg, his hour come at last, slouched his way toward Bethlehem to give birth to Facebook. Like other addictions, surfing the internet can take control of people's lives, and in some cases, totally destroys them. 2003 was the time of shock and awe, Pyrrhic victories, and the return of kings. It was also a year when not even music was safe from defilement, after Metallica released the musical equivalent of the Iraq invasion. They weaponized the snare drum into a clanging cacophony of tuneless morass on one of the most relentlessly hateful albums ever forced upon a CD, Saint Anger. Jesus Christ. Which is a long-winded way of saying that, aside from the return of the king, 2003 kinda sucked. And even the return of the king was too fucking long with too many fake-out endings and the CGI looks awful nowadays. I mean, look at this fucking surfing Legolas sh**. Spin now you're in with the techno set, you're going surfing on the internet. 2003 also sucked for the UFC. Dana White still looked like this and their courting of the Just Bleed demographic proved to be less lucrative than imagined. MMA was banned in multiple states. And from my standpoint, we shouldn't just be trying to regulate what is inherently barbaric, we should be looking to make it illegal. And big fight cards saw action from such megastars as Falanico Vitale and Wesley Cohea. Who the fuck is that guy? After a mild boom in the 90s due to the curiosity of seeing what would happen when a barroom brawler fought a taekwondo master or whatever, by 2003, the UFC was just bleeding its way to bankruptcy. In an attempt to try and bolster his organization's popularity and prove that the UFC was the number one MMA promotion in the world, Dana White slithered his way to Japan to go head to head with pride. His secret weapon in all of this was a fighter named Chuck the Iceman Liddell. I'm putting that belt on my desk, we're taking it, I'm coming for it. Liddell was one of the first MMA breakout stars in the United States, thanks in part to his rivalry with Tito Ortiz. And while he had never won UFC gold, his last fight before Dana dragged him over to Japan had been an interim light heavyweight title shot against Randy Couture. Randy had won, but Dana didn't care because Dana hated Randy Couture and loved Chuck. You see, Chuck had something very few fighters ever achieve, the love and respect of Dana White. And while Dana's affections can be as fickle as sunshine on a spring day, in 2003, Chuck and Dana were the first real MMA power couple. For this reason, Dana was convinced Chuck was his man to prove to the world that the UFC was superior to Pride. Dana entered Chuck into Pride's eight-man elimination tournament. The fights would take place at Total Elimination 2003 in August and Final Conflict in November. So confident was Dana in his adoration for Liddell that he made a $250,000 wager with Sakaki Barra that Chuck would win the entire tournament and KO Vanderlei. The fight with Vanderlei was what Dana wanted more than anything else, even more so than winning the tournament. And Dana just wanted his number one star to KO Pride's number one star in a pissing contest where the prize was brain damage. And Silva clearly had some unresolved issues with Chuck that he needed to work out. Because I want to fuck, I want to fight with Chuck. In the opening bracket, Chuck would face an up-and-coming fighter named Alistair Overeem. You probably remember Overeem as a man so ludicrously muscled that he seemed in constant danger of going full Tetsuo and exploding into an endlessly expanding flood of muscle and ligature. Whoa! Can you put that shit, buddy? You're probably wondering how in the name of performance enhancing drugs, Chuck Liddell was ever matched up against a man single-handedly responsible for a global shortage in anabolic steroids and a global surplus of swollenness. The answer is that in 2003, 
Overeem hadn't yet been introduced to the all horse meat diet. He fought at light heavyweight and actually looked like a normal human being and less like Bane from Arkham Asylum on steroids. Dana White sat ringside as part of the commentary team and with the reputation of his entire company at stake in front of a global audience, Dana was not his usual obnoxious self we've all grown to know and tolerate over the years. That's fucking illegal. And his best prediction that he could offer was, we'll see what happens. Dana seemed genuinely nervous. Dana, I know you're trembling. I know you're feeling it right now. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't. <laughs> Absolutely. Something so out of character, it was like hearing a cat bark or finding a Rage Against the Machine album called The Miracle of Consumer Capitalism. Just in case the audience wasn't 100% sure which fighter was Dana's boy, Chuck walked out to the UFC's theme tune, the old theme tune that is, before they got too cool for early 2000s rap metal. Fucking sellouts. But Pride either didn't get the memo or didn't give a crap because they misspelled his name on both the Titantron and in every single interview. In the opening round, Overeem landed a left hand that dropped Liddell momentarily, but he was able to clinch and survive. Toward the end of the round, Overeem seemed to have completely gassed, and after he missed with a sloppy, half-assed kick, Chuck landed an overhand right that seemed to make Overeem stop fighting for a second and contemplate the mysteries of the universe. Chuck pressured him against the ropes and finished him with knees and straight punches. For the first time since his arrival in Japan, Dana unclenched, tore off his headset and ran into the ring to congratulate Chuck. And I'm just really excited. Chuck came into the ring and gave me this and goes, I'll give you the other half in November. I'm putting that belt on my desk. We're taking it. I'm coming for it. The first stage of the eight-man tournament was a success for the UFC. Chuck earned enough experience points to unlock the romance option with Dana and Sakakibara felt a cold sweat creep from the pores on the back of his neck when he remembered where he had borrowed that 250 grand from. The final clash of Pride and the UFC took place at Pride Total Elimination 2003 in November of that year. Chuck faced Rampage Jackson, with the winner expected to fight again that night, taking on the winner of Vanderlei Silva versus Hidehiko Yoshida. With 250k on the line and the reputation of his company and his biggest star also at stake, Dana's anxiety levels were around about the same as when he found out his own mother had written a tell-all book about him. His marriage is a joke. He puts Tiger Woods to shame. The ring card girls sleep with him. Uh, I do believe Dana's used steroids. But he was willing to at least make the bold claim that he knew who was going to win. Pride showcased just how few fucks they were able to cobble together for Chuck by yet again misspelling his name everywhere possible. And at this stage, the only thing surprising about his walkout was that Pride didn't add a laugh track. <laughs> Rampage Jackson walked out to his very own early 2000s hip-hop banger. The Rampage song was a direct-to-limewire classic, almost pornographic in its awfulness, but was absolutely the kind of shit made for blasting out of Winamp on Windows XP. Cool. Round one was fairly even, with both Chuck and Rampage landing hard shots, but towards the end of the first 10 minute round, Rampage seemed to be taking control and landing more, and would have slammed Chuck to the mat but for the fact that Chuck grabbed the rope. Dana, sensing that wagering the reputation of your entire company on one man maybe wasn't the brightest idea, began squirming uncomfortably and bemoaned the fact that Chuck was deviating from the game plan they had formulated based on Dana's extensive years of boxer-size training. Very slow pace, Chuck has an implemented game plan, he's not doing any leg kicks. Uh, you know, he had 10 minutes here to really work on Rampage's legs, so that when he came out for the second round, he, he wouldn't have any legs and uh, not implementing the game plan at all. In between rounds, Dana confessed that he was horrified by what he had just seen. He looks tired to me right now, which is absolutely horrifying. <laughs> 
It's unconfirmed whether Sakaki Barra at this point was laughing maniacally atop of Castle Grayskull, but it's safe to assume he was. <laughs> I can remember when I've had a more pleasant day. <laughs> In round two, the writing was on the wall for Dana from the opening bell. A visibly exhausted Iceman was taken down by... He rained down shots until Chuck's corner was forced to throw in the towel. And like that, Dana White's very own Operation Barbarossa came to a shuddering halt. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Dana was gracious in defeat and offered all the assistance he had brought to help Chuck in between fights to Rampage. Uh, now probably what we'll do is we, we've set up a lot of work to be done in between the fights, right? Uh, on Chuck to help refresh him and get him ready. I'll send that whole team over to Rampage's locker room to help uh, Rampage get back together to win the uh, tournament. The colossal prick even managed to sound magnanimous. Now probably what we'll do is we, we've set up a lot of- Watch this, Lise. You can actually pinpoint the second when his heart rips in half. And... now! Ah. On the other side of the tournament, Vanderlei faced off against Hidehiko Yoshida. Yoshida was an Olympic gold medalist in judo and fought in his full judo gi, much to the hilarity of new pride commentator and sentient toenail clipping, Damon Perry. Hey dog. Yo. Yoshida is going to wear the gi, but he's not going to wear those black socks. No black socks? No black socks. Well, according to my Hong Kong book of Kung Fu on how to wear a gi, ah uh, yes, here it is, black socks. Perry replaced Stephen Quadros, and his style of commentary employed the technical analysis of Mike Goldberg. Michael Jordan esque in his grappling skills is Travis Luter. No, no, it's not. He's not that good. With the comedy stylings of Tito, Perry spends almost all of the fight taking a Thanos sized shit on Yoshida's chances against the axe murderer. Hey, let me tell you, he's gonna have to wear black socks, blue socks, anything to help him because nobody thinks he has a chance against Silva here. As a matter of fact, this fight might be a little too easy for Silva. And to be fair, even Bass Rutten gets in a few cheap laughs as they both envision just how badly Vanderlei is going to fuck Yoshida up. I don't see any problem for uh, Vanderlei. This fight is over early. Keep your black socks, you're gonna need them. The beach is around the corner. The black socks and the gi, it's a good look. While Perry got a good laugh out of the fact that he was wearing a gi, Yoshida wasn't some Ashida Kim-esque ninja LARPing troglodyte. He may have worn a gi, but that was where similarities with Kim ended. A year before he fought Vanderlei, Yoshida had broken Don fucking Fry's arm with an armbar at Pride 23. One arm of a prime Don Fry is equal to 20 Conor McGregor ankles, which should give you some idea of how difficult it is to break. It's safe to say that nobody expected Yoshida to win this fight or even survive out of the first round. And while Perry assumed that this fight was going to be about as memorable as a bassline in an Oasis song, the Japanese audience were hyped to the point of spontaneous human combustion. Look at the stare. Look at that, baby! Yoshida shows absolutely not. Yoshida vs. Silva was one of the biggest fights of the evening. After Silva had finished massacring their boy Sakuraba, the Japanese fans were desperate for redemption in the form of a G in a Gi. A G and a Gi might start the party, but you don't need a Gi, all you need is Bacardi. Bring a CD and some Bob Marley, you should get heavy like tons of broccoli. Cool. Every time Yoshida so much as blocked a punch, the entire arena erupted like he had just landed a 360 no-scope. And when Yoshida managed to actually take Vanderlei down, the audience evolved into beings of pure energy and ascended to the astral plane. 
After a brief exchange on the feet, round one saw Yoshida take down Vanderlei and kept him on the mat for the majority of the round. There was some back and forth grappling, with Vanderlei threatening a triangle, Yoshida threatening a few gi chokes, and Vanderlei kicking the crap out of Yoshida's legs to try and get him to stand up. If you watched round one with the volume muted, it would honestly be kind of boring. There isn't a huge amount of action, there's some fun grappling, but most of the enjoyment really stems from seeing someone expected to be offered up as a blood sacrifice escape their fate and put up a fight, like the MMA equivalent of Apocalypto. And combined with the insane crowd pop every time literally anything happens, makes you feel like you just watched Fry vs Takayama on 2.5x speed. In round 2, the Just Bleed Gods grimaced down upon Vanderlei, and both fighters started trading strikes. Yoshida had an all-you-can-eat breakfast buffet of knees directly to the head after a failed takedown, and in a display of some of the finest acting this side of Vernon Wells and Commando, Yoshida laughed them off. But seconds later, Silva landed a high kick directly from the ninth circle of hell. Yoshida didn't have the acting talent to pull it off, and was clearly rocked. Vanderlei grabbed Yoshida by the gi, and proceeded to hold him in place while directing kicks to the head. With only a minute to go, Yoshida attempted a takedown, but ends up with Silva in half guard. With mere seconds to go, Yoshida performed a beautiful sweep to end up on top in Vanderlei's closed guard, and the crowd reacted like he just KO'd him with a spinning 360 pile driver. Look at this, look at this! Probably 15 Whoa. seconds here. And Yoshida knows it, there it is, there's the bell, there's the bell! Sadly for Yoshida, it was just a little too late. The bell rung, and thanks to his vicious surge in the last round, Vanderlei was proclaimed the winner. The fight was awarded Fight of the Year for 2003, and while there were better fights that year, hell, there were better fights that night, this fight deserved that accolade simply because Yoshida was expected by everyone to do nothing but stand there and wait for Silva to axe kick him through the mat like a stake being pounded into the dirt. But Yoshida didn't wilt under Vanderlei's stare down, or even take a step backwards when Silva tried to kick his head into a low earth orbit. That Yoshida not only survived, but actually took it to a judge's decision that could conceivably have been given to him was one of the biggest underdog stories of that era. Yoshida's career in MMA may not have had the drama of Sakuraba or the highlight reel knockouts of Vanderlei, and he may be largely forgotten by MMA fans nowadays, but on that November night in 2003, he showed the world a level of toughness that few other fighters possess. In the final, Silva faced off against Rampage. Okay, what the fuck? Why does it keep doing that every time I say Rampage? Oh, hold on. S Silva faced off against Quinton Jackson in the final. After the kind of stare down that would normally end with someone getting glassed, the final of the eight man tournament was on. One thing to point out before we continue is that there is a little bit of MMA history on Jackson's shorts. No, not SeriousPimp.com, even though I can only imagine that website was the greatest thing on the internet in 2003, but the other sponsor, ShareDog.com. For anyone unaware, ShareDog is an independent MMA website founded in 1997 and still running today, and its sponsorship of Jackson is probably the most 2003 thing about this entire video. 2003 was a different era for both fighting and the internet, an era when what was basically some guy's MMA fan site could become popular enough to become a sponsor on one of the biggest fights of the year. In its heyday, ShareDog was even the official MMA partner for ESPN, which is insane to think about. Before ESPN partnered with the fucking UFC, they reached out to some dude's glorified GeoCities website for partnership. 
It shows how much the MMA landscape has changed, that in 2003, sites like ShareDog were actually embraced by the UFC in order to try and help grow the popularity of the sport at a grassroots level. Dana had an on-again, off-again friendship with ShareDog and even gave them media credentials to attend UFC events, but in typical Dana fashion, he would have one of his trademark changes of heart in 2010 when he announced that he and ShareDog were never friends and banned them from UFC events. The modern day equivalent of such a tiny independent sponsor on such a big stage would be like if Valentina walked out with my face on her shorts, ravishing Rick Rude style. <laughs> Stupid sexy Valentina! Back in the fight, Jackson immediately picked up Silva and threatened for a slam, but Silva had a guillotine locked in, so instead they just hung out on the ropes looking like Silva was Jackson's long lost fiance who had just leapt into his arms. Jackson brought the fight to the mat, and after a few minutes of being stuck inside Silva's closed guard, the fight was stood up by the referee. Silva entered Spartan rage mode and immediately took control of the fight, pummeling Jackson with so many knees it seemed like he may have smuggled extra legs into the ring. After a creeping barrage of knees, somehow Jackson was still on his feet, but Silva still had one last tiger knee left and after using it to erase Jackson's memories of his teenage years, the ref stopped the fight. Silva was the Pride Total Elimination 2003 Tournament Champion. Jackson developed genuphobia, and Dana and his cat Azrael skulked back to the mushroom forest to plot their revenge. In the years since the UFC bought Pride, they have at times attempted to rewrite history around Chuck's foray into the East, and even claimed that Chuck ruled Pride on the official UFC Facebook page. Chuck ruled Pride much the same way as the New Radicals ruled music in 1999. Sure they had one hit, but then they kindly fucked off and had the good manners to never bother us again. Chuck still had a great career ahead of him in the UFC and he deserves MMA legend status, but he certainly didn't rule pride. By now in our story, we've reached 2004. Pride has proved it's the number one MMA organization in the world, vanquishing domestic threats from Inoki Bombaye and foreign threats from the UFC. Its roster of fighters is the greatest in the world. Not since the PlayStation 2's release schedule in 2001 has there been a lineup with such a surplus of talent. Fedor, Krokop, Sakuraba, Vanderlei, Nogueira, The Rizza, The Jizza, Old Dirty Bastard, Inspector Deck, and Raekwon the Chef. Dana's excursion to Japan was a flaccid embarrassment for the UFC, but Dana is nothing if not ruthless. And while Sakaki Barra was laughing now, just three short years later, Dana would have his revenge. And to borrow a phrase from famous rapper Halleck Gracie, shit was about to get heavy like a ton of broccoli. Dicey, dicey! Whoa. Mr. Shab, sorry for your loss. Ah!